I'd like to call the school committee meeting for Monday, April 30th, 2018 to order. Uh, roll call, please. Okay. John Nunes? Here. Dr. Jenkins? Here. Kathleen Amaral? Here. Here. Thank you. Would you all stand for the Pledge of Allegiance, please? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. If I could ask you all to please remain standing for a moment, I'd like to have a Moment of silence for a former school committee member a number of years ago uh, and the father of uh, former state representative John Quinn. Uh, Judge Attorney Tom Quinn passed away this weekend at 89 years old. I'd like a moment of silence for him, please. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I'd like to uh, ask, remind everyone to uh, Please, if you have any cell phones, pages, electronic devices, if you could put them on silent or vibrate or shut them off, I would uh, greatly appreciate it. Also, too, this meeting is being taped for future broadcast on uh, Dartmouth Cable Television, uh, Wednesdays, Fridays, Sundays, and whatever times that they have uh, room to put them on, which we appreciate. And also, uh, Dartmouth YouTube, our students are here doing that. Uh, at this point in time, we've uh, allocated some time on the agenda for uh, public comment. If uh, there is any comment uh, on tonight's agenda, uh, you're more than welcome to come up to the podium. We'll just ask uh, for your name and address, please. I'll speak. Okay. Takes care of that. Next item is approval of the regular session minutes of April 9th, 2018. Move approval. Moved by the, uh, Dr. Jenkins, second by Dr. Kara Fotis on the motion. Any discussion? Chair hearing none. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Next uh, item of business is our student representative report. Charlotte? Uh, we hosted Corey Palazzi at the high school who uh, shared his story about the dangers of opioid abuse with our community through two pretty powerful assemblies. Um, also before vacation, the Dartmouth High School Color Guard traveled to Dayton, Ohio, had a very strong competition in their new division at World Championships. Uh, the next week, the Dartmouth High School Indoor Percussion finished second in Dayton and were fan favorite for the fifth year in a row. Um, as of right now, 70 10th grade students at Dartmouth High have completed a field test in preparation for next year's computerized MCAS exam. Um, and last week, we had six students return from a very successful trip to the International DECA competition in Atlanta. Uh, Shane Rose and Tony Root each placed first in their preliminary, preliminary events, and Jack Pullen finished third in the Stu Kent Social Media Challenge. So congratulations to all of those students as well as their advisor, Mrs. Kane. And this week, the Dartmouth High School Theater Company invites members of the community to their presentation of Beauty and the Beast. Uh, opening night is Thursday at 7, and there'll be showings Friday and Saturday at the same time, as well as an additional matinee on Saturday afternoon at 1 p.m. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions for our student rep? Thank you. Okay. All right. We're going to... Uh, Move on with the agenda. We're going to move over uh, our recognition at the moment because not everyone is available. Uh, Mrs. Vieira, are you ready? Would you like? Would you like me? You're just going to jump on the agenda. Yeah, I'm going to jump you up on the agenda. How's that? Good evening. <coughs> My name is Renee Vieira, and um, I'm president of the Dartmouth Educators Association. And tonight, um, I stand before you to discuss some concerns with our health care premiums and um, the cost of health care in the town of Dartmouth. So, um, 
We here in Dartmouth recognize that we have a very good health plan relative to our benefits. And most folks in the audience that utilize Blue Cross and Blue Shield will tell you that when it comes to our benefit package and being able to um, insure ourselves and our families, we have no complaints with what the plan has to offer. We do, however, have some great concerns with the premium splits as well as the overall cost of the health care. Um, a few years back, we had the IAC just um, we had an IAC committee, and then in 2013, we had to form a PEC, and that PEC committee had to do with the fact that the, the town wanted to change the premium copay um, amounts. So the PEC met, and then once that was resolved, um, it, we went back to the IAC group. Now, as um, a member of the IAC, I represent the Dartmouth educators. Um, and we are the, the largest voting body, if you will. We have the, the most members that utilize the plan. The concern is, and I, I, I don't mean to um, sound disrespectful, the concern is that when we sit across the table and we negotiate contracts, the response that we get um, from the superintendent by way of you know, your, your message is basically, OK, we don't deal with the health care costs. We're not dealing with the health care plans. Right now, we're looking at contract language. Well, there are two laws that govern us in being able to do that. In um, Mass General Law Chapter um, 150E, which is our basic bargaining right, gives the school committee direct permission and direct legal obligation to be able to um, negotiate the premium splits with us. So when we look at section 32 um, and we look at sections 22, 21 through 23, that has to do with plan design. And that is something that we would have to look at with the town. And that kind of takes place through the IAC. That advisory committee then would look at different plan designs and to see what's the best fit. Then based on recommendations, the select board decides if it has enough buy-in to be able to then pass it on to its unions. So the select board would negotiate with the other unions, and then it would fall upon your lap to negotiate it with us. So Jim Kiley has been in contact with me, and he had asked that we, the DEA, consider looking at a, a high deductible plan, this Access Blue. And initially, um, within the IAC, the department heads that were there, there are four of us mainly, myself, the Police Brotherhood, the uh, Dartmouth Town employees, as well as the um, department heads, which are represented, they're part of the Steelworkers Union. The four of us are the ones that are most active in the IAC. And we recognize that it does seem to have some desirability to it. And we spoke with Mr. Kylie, and he was very nice to be able to set up a spreadsheet with us so we could look at some cost savings. But I just wanted to share some concerns with you. So, and if I go on too long, John, just give me that. I'll give you the look. Okay, and I'll just go and not see it. Okay, so anyway. As far as school districts, in this region, we are the lowest premium split district. We are 5248, and just a few years ago, the school department all the school unions were 50-50, and the other unions in town actually went up to percent so the other union said 5248 and with a little bit of discussion between us you folks helped us to get at that 5248 and that took um, was about a, a year in talking about that but even at 5248 within the region the next lowest region is a 6040 many of them at 7525 there used to be a couple of 9010s and now they've dropped back to um, you know to about 85 but the common um, you know, the most common one in the region is 7525, and we are at 5248. So that becomes a problem. And I've spoken to you before in the past regarding health care costs because it's hard, very hard for us to be able to um, entice folks to apply to our district. And even those folks that do apply, when we bring them over to central office and we show them our wonderful package, um, a number of people have had to say, thank you, but no thank you, I can't afford the health care plan. And we know this in town. And we know that as a school committee, there's only so much power you have. But one of the powers that you do have is to be able to help us try to change that premium split. Mm -hmm. 
Along with section uh, 21 and 23, there's another section that we do not believe has been adopted. And I checked with Greg Barnes, and as far as he knew, section 19 was not adopted. And the relevance of section 19 is that if section 19 is not adopted, then the separate unions in town can actually negotiate their own premium splits. So what that means is, the school committee, if you chose to negotiate with us, we could negotiate a change in premiums that's different from the 5248, and it doesn't bind the select board to bargain the same or to come up with the same result with the other town unions. Now, recognizing, we'll say, um, politically wanting to keep everyone on the same page, that's typically what we've done in the past. Similar with our negotiations, when I bargain to represent the teachers or the teaching assistants or the nurses, we recognize when we look at our percent increases, we try to keep an even playing field. So that being said, it might not be politically desirable to separate us, but we are the largest group. Behind us is the police union and the, and the police brotherhood in us. We're kind of um, the DEA. We're very close in um, what we would like uh, to see to be able to entice um, higher quality applicants, if you will, to be able to decide to come and work in this town and, and to be able to stay. Any questions at the moment? No? Okay. okay. Thank you. So now, if we consider if we consider this high deductible plan, which is called Access Blue New England, the town has, um, through uh, Greg Barnes, has offered a 60-40 split. Now that is somewhat enticing, but the 60-40 split, in and of itself, it is somewhat of a money saver. But to break even, basically what would happen is, when you compare that to the HMO family plan, and I'm using just family plan numbers, um, you end up with a potential $4,000 increase. It seems like you know, you'd save $4,000. However, the deductibles are different, and the um, what you know your payouts, what your co-pays are uh, for pharmaceuticals, etc. So there's a lot at play there. But basic, <coughs> basically, asking around through MTA and looking at other towns because it's 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 high-end, high-deductible insurance policies are kind of you know those they're across the state right now as as possible proposals. And the concern is that if you're an individual, young, healthy. And if you're male, it helps. It's a really good plan. If you're starting a family, if you have a family that's on the younger end, your children just starting to grow up, or if you are married, so you're an individual plus one, you know, a small family and your children are grown, but you're at the other end, but you're not near retirement, then the high end, um, you know, the, the high deductible is kind of a, it's a gamble. We do recognize that the town has said that they would put in, um, in the difference that they would be able to save from one plan to the other, which is if a family plan, like myself, I have an HMO, if I choose to go to the high deductible, that will save the town $299 and change. They have promised, but not yet in writing, but they have promised that they would roll that over into a health uh, savings trust, but they're not legally bound to do that. So one of the concerns we had in the IAC was that we would want that to be in writing, that they would legally continue to do it every year, not just the first year. And then we start out, because once you use that 299, your health savings account is empty, and you have to take the monies that you're potentially not paying that are being pulled out of your paycheck and enter it into the savings account yourself. One of the little red flags that came up in when I was uh, looking at all of this information is that the Affordable Health Care Act, um, I am not sure, but the town could possibly be in penalty with the Affordable Health Care Act because the town needs to be able to offer a health plan that is affordable to low-wage earners. And the Access Blue with the 6040 would be affordable, a much more affordable plan for some folks. Not that they have to take it, but if it's offered as an option, then the town doesn't necessarily get penalized for having such a high cost HMO and then an even higher cost PPO. So I don't know if that is an issue right now, but I'm concerned that one of the reasons to roll this in is because it would allow the town to be able to waive that penalty and to be able to legally offer it. But if you're 
in a family plan and you are a low wage earner and you take this plan, it's not like you're going to have <coughs> monies aside to be able to pay that $4,000 deductible. <coughs> and nothing is covered until you pay that $4,000. Got it. All right. I'll try to speed this up. <coughs> so. <coughs> the last concern that I have about looking at this high, high deductible plan is that right now the GIC uses Tufts Navigator. The GIC, well, the state has been very reluctant in paying its bills. So we know that it owes, the GIC owes <coughs> doctors in this state an awful lot of money. So it's fine, you know, the state's finding that Tufts Navigator is, it's a nice idea, but it's a bit expensive. So now, if the town, if we choose to adopt this high deductible plan. If we say, okay, we can use Access Blue as an option. We need to keep the PPO as an indemnity plan. We can't get rid of that. And then we have the HMO. If the state decides that its new benchmark for GIC is going to be a high deductible and we have that offered, then the town can legally take all of us and move us directly into that high deductible plan. So then we could lose the option of being able to choose between an HMO and the high deductible. But if we do not have that on the table in town, if it's not an option, then it's not something that the town can ask to put into place to offset. The town would have to look at what it does offer, and it could ask us to accept its, you know, the counterpart that meets that benchmark the best. So that's another concern that we have um, on the IAC with accepting <coughs> this high deductible plan as a third option. Lastly, I don't know this answer, and Jim isn't here this evening, but I was just wondering in looking through um, the school committee budget, if it's within the school committee's budget to pay for um, the school department's health care costs, or is it part of the town budget? Part of the, um, that's part of the town cost. Okay. Part of the, it's, a, it's a line item in the town budget. Okay. So it, may, it won't save the school committee or our school budget directly. However, if we were able to, um, negotiate a change in the, in the premium split that would make the PPO, which is expensive and actually costs us money, it makes our um, loss ratio really high. Don't I sound like I kind of know my numbers? <laughs> I, phew, I have been studying this and picking this apart. So because our loss ratios are so high with the PPO, we only have a few families actually town-wide that actually use it. And I believe a majority of them are school employees. We can't drop it, but if we maintain that premium split where it is, and then we make the HMO seem a little bit more enticing, we might, you know, kind of entice some of those folks to roll into the HMO, still offering it, but if fewer members are using it, then it does bring the cost down. Because the high price of the PPO and the fact that uh, we're over our claims there is causing everyone within the group to, um, to have to pay for that. We left being self-insured, we're now part of Maya. I know that's not something that you folks negotiate. That is something that I'm trying to um, discuss with the select board. We did ask at the IAC that we um, renew Maya, like on a yearly plan, but I just wanted to explain, in, in case you weren't aware, that when we left being self-insured, we had reserves that the employees paid into as well as the employer, but it was, it was employee money. It was if you were using the healthcare benefit, Blue Cross Blue, <coughs> Blue Shield, there was a reserve plan. So those monies for the last two years have been used to offset the increase in premiums. So right now, if you're using Blue Cross Blue Shield, you're gonna be faced with a, a little bit more than a 12% increase. Just saying it makes me ill beyond. However, the last two years has been an 8% increase, but we've only felt the effects of four because we had enough, the town had enough in reserves to be able to reduce it by four, but the reserves are spent. But it was our monies that we had paid into it. So it made sense to use it that way, but we did not, or Maya did not explain or plan ahead enough for us to recognize that in year three we would be faced with a 12% increase. So I really thank you for your time. I welcome any form of negotiations that you folks might consider in helping us um, to make it more palatable to want to stay in Dartmouth, um, to want to work in Dartmouth, and to be able to <coughs> raise a family on this health plan. We know that we have members that are individual, um, you know, they're 
family, but it's basically individual plus one, but they're paying a family group. We have, as IAC, <coughs> looked at comparing individual rates, family rates, and individual plus one. Um, mathematically, you're taking monies here and you're applying them there. But if we could do something to offset the premium costs, um, I think it would help us to keep folks and would entice those that consider applying and do applying to being able to stay. So I thank you for your time. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Very nice presentation, Renee. Thank you. Very good. Yeah. So I'll, I'll just say, you know, I 100% I agree with you, Ms. Vieira. Um, when I first started on the Finance Committee, I was pretty shocked <coughs> to find out that we are at 50-50. I think it, it's, it's not competitive in the market around us. It's not where we should be. It's not where we need to be. Um, I'm glad we're at 52.48, but that's still, that's better than when we started, when I started volunteering, but it's still not anywhere where we ought to be, to be comparable. And I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because I think for the people who are not here, who are watching it, I don't think people know that, that, that they just look at salary. They don't, they think the benefits are all generous and they don't look at it in comparison to other communities. And so I think it's important for us to talk about that. I mean, obviously the concern is that the town has no money right now. If it were up to me and I could control the budget, I'd give you all big raises and I'd put the, um, the health care costs where I think they should be. But that's where we're sort of faced right now is in this fiscal climate, right, to figure out how to, to make this work. But I, but I do understand your concerns because I think it's not right where we are right now. Um, and we need to find a way to, to try to move that. I'd just my like opinion. to agree with her. Um, we have lost candidates that have yeah. come through the process and right to the hiring process and when they saw the plan uh, backed out of it. Yep. So it is a, it's she's a absolutely right on. Yeah, a, it is a big problem. It's been a problem for a lot of years. Yeah. Very good. Okay. We're good. All right. Uh, Dr. Gifford. Back. What are we up to? Are we ready for our? So we'd like to invite uh, principal of the high school, Mr. Tebow, to the podium to um, provide some nice recognitions for some folks out here. So we're excited to hear about this. Good evening, and thank you to the school committee for allowing me this opportunity to address you and to share some exciting um, achievements that have occurred over at Dartmouth High School uh, over the past couple of weeks. Um, this is absolutely the best part of my job is being able to celebrate and recognize some of the outstanding achievement of our faculty and students. Um, so it's a pleasure to be here uh, this evening. The first um, person I'd like to recognize uh, is our school uh, represent our student representative, Charlotte Carrero. Um, it's my uh, pleasure to recognize her as the Rensselaer Medal Award winner at Dartmouth High School this year. Mm -hmm. Founded in 1916, um, the award is given each year to a junior at Dartmouth High School um, in uh, recognition for academic excellence in math and science. Uh, and the award um, comes with it, uh, comes, coming with the award rather, is a $25,000 per year merit-based scholarship should Charlotte decide to apply, be accepted, and enroll at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. Um, so we're looking at $100,000 to $125,000 depending on whether it's a four-year or a five-year program. Um, again, uh, Charlotte is an outstanding member of our school community and she has the opportunity to share and highlight all of the achievements of everyone else. Um, here from the uh, school committee um, table, and so I think it's only fitting that we recognize Charlotte and congratulate her tonight. Congratulations. Congratulations. Mom, Dad, if you're here, you want to come up and take pictures? Yeah. Please. Right there. <laughs> yes, so then we can put it on our Facebook page. Yes. <laughs> Fantastic. The next student that I'd like to celebrate and recognize is Mary Bancroft, our executive editor of the Dartmouth High School um, newspaper, <coughs> Spectrum. Mary uh, recently 
back in March, uh, received a national silver medal from Scholastic for the Scholastic Art and Writing Awards. Um, and just to put that in perspective, 35,000 pieces of writing and art are submitted annually uh, for, for consideration. Um, and so Mary um, was selected for high honors um, and, and as a result received the silver medal. But also recently she was recognized by the Standard Times for an article she wrote in an interview she conducted with Pete Souza, who was the uh, chief photographer for both President Ronald Reagan as well as President uh, Barack Obama. Uh, Pete is a former graduate of Dartmouth High School. Um, but beyond that, again, Mary's excellence in writing and in journalism um, has been recognized. Um, she was featured in the Standard Times and on a podcast that the Standard Times did. And again, we are very, very proud of Mary. Um, she has a very bright future ahead of her uh, and is very deserving of this recognition. So congratulations to Mary. <laughs> and so in addition to our outstanding students, we also have many, many outstanding and dedicated faculty members. <coughs> um, and tonight, it's my pleasure to recognize and to share with the community um, some great news we received about uh, John Bro. John is a special education teacher and coach of Unified Athletics at Dartmouth High School. And about a month ago, um, anyone who is involved in Unified Athletics uh, in any capacity received an email from the MIAA and the Massachusetts Special Olympics um, saying that, you know, there was this opportunity to nominate coaches for Coach of the Year. Um, and I believe. I'm not sure, but I believe it's the first time the MIAA has recognized a unified athletic coach. Coach Karen, is that accurate? It is. Um, and so Mr. Karen and I uh, met, we talked about it, and we decided that John would be extremely deserving of this award. Um, and we nominated him, you know, wishing and hoping that he, he would receive it because he's definitely deserving of it. And then the Friday uh, evening, just before um, April vacation began, we were notified that John had been selected as Unified Track and Field Coach of the Year for the state of Massachusetts. So congratulations to <laughs> Coach Brown. Um, so John will officially accept that award um, later on next month, May 24th, or I guess actually May starts tomorrow, so. <laughs> it's, it's Still month. next month. <laughs> yeah. So um, at any rate, thank you very much for allowing us to recognize that outstanding any, achievement of many of our community members. Anytime, thank you, thank you Mr. Thank you. Mr. Dubo. My colleagues. Any comments? No, just congratulations to yeah. all of those uh, that we're awarded, and uh, we, we've got a great program here in Dartmouth. We really do, and it shows. And it's nights like this that I love being up here. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you. Dr. Carafotis? Um, I just want to say the same thing. Um, these, these awards don't come easily. People who receive these awards have worked very, very hard and have contributed much. So I thank you from the bottom of my heart for what you're doing for John, for what you're doing for the students, and for our students for doing such an excellent job. And I understand how hard you must work in order to get that recognition. So congratulations. Congratulations, Charlotte and Mary and John. <laughs> I will also just say congratulations. I'll echo, I'll echo my colleagues' uh, comments. And again, congratulations to everybody. and. Yeah, Chris is right. It's nights like this that really make it enjoyable and why we do what we do, not the minutia, the, the great stuff that goes on in our schools. And not everybody's aware of what goes on and the good stuff that goes on in our schools. And when we get an opportunity to talk about it and, yeah, we're going to brag and pat ourselves on the back for it as, as we should. It's always a pleasure and enjoyable to, to do something of that nature. So. Again, my congratulations to all of you, and 
you know, RPI is, you know, looks nice. <laughs> and, and Mary, the English Award, fantastic. All the best. Thank you. Okay. That being said, the next is a present Jeff, present Jeff Mr. Cameron, our astute athletic director and director of physical education and health. And a nice overview of the athletic department. Good evening, everyone. I'm guessing uh, Mr. Oliver and Mr. Nunes didn't mean this was the highlight of the year, this part. <laughs> but, um, nevertheless, I appreciate the time to share some of what we, uh, we do in our uh, athletic department as well as our health and phys ed department. Um, so let me just, I'll start with the athletic side of things, if I may, uh, and if I can make sure I get through this part. So I have some data just to share. I figured people could stare at it as I speak. Um, kind of broke down our program into different things. The first thing is our athletes. And some of the numbers become astounding. The first time I started doing this, I didn't realize how many kids actually participate and, and, and how many kids we get out on the fields every day. So that's just a quick rundown of our, of our school year. Some of this is to date because it's obviously still May and some things haven't, haven't happened yet. But uh, 1,141 registrations, that won't change as we're in the middle of the season. Um, that's 1,036 participants, which is also comprised of 567 students, which is roughly 50%. So 50% of our student body participating in athletics is, is very, very good. Um, there's other schools uh, I speak to, athletic directors, they're down in the 20s. So 50% is, is a very strong number. We also broke down our one, two, and our three season athletes. You see we have uh, upwards of 140 kids that are playing three sports, which is a, a huge commitment from the months of August into June. Um, so that's just a bit about the kids and, and what they do. Um, also just broke down some of our coaching figures. Obviously in a perfect world, every, we have 100% of our coaches who are the best and brightest uh, coaching those particular sports and they'll all be teachers in our schools. It's not the case in every instance, but we, we do pretty well there with the 62 total positions, uh, 24 and 38 is the breakdown from head and assistant, and 72% are, uh, are seven, uh, DPS employees, and 89% of our, 88 I think it is, of, of our head coaches are employees. I think that's pretty good. Uh, and I think the strength there is that those people know, um, not to sound cliche, but know how to teach and coach the whole child, and they're not just coming in and talking about the sport. They're sensitive to other things that are, exist in the kids' lives, um, academics being certainly not the least. Um, the competition, um, this is just some kind of boring stuff, but we participate in a small league. Some are aware of that. There's really only three teams in our league, so we have to go out and find games. That's probably the most challenging part of my job. Each year it gets a little bit worse. Uh, we play against 51 different schools uh, because of that um, in 24 different sports this year. Uh, we scheduled 722 competitions, and to date we've taken 316 trips. That number will probably look more like 370. 375 by the end of the year. I, I also just broke it down by fall. Uh, the, you can see, I won't bore you with the numbers, but those are our records. It also shows um, that I think eight of our nine teams this fall made the state tournament, which is very good. Uh, obviously, each team, their, their, their goal each season, beyond just the obvious successes, is to make the state tournament. It's an ultimate goal, and so eight out of the nine teams doing that is, is quite impressive. Um, we did the same thing for the winter. Um, where five out of our six teams qualified for state tournament play. Uh, we also did it for the spring. Spring is obviously TBA because we're halfway through and we've already postponed 51 games in the last 28 days. So you see what our records are. Our teams are actually doing very well despite our challenges. Uh, and we'll see how many of our teams qualify for tournament. My guess at this point is we'll see quite a few, if not all, uh, qualify for state tournament, which is, you know, obviously they're, they're always their benchmark, but there are other things to look at as well. Um, to date, we have three league champions. Although we're in a league of three, it's a very good league. Barnstable and Bridgewater Rainham are formidable opponents in most sports. So we've, uh, we've been able to get, capture three championships, uh, boys cross country, our indoor and our outdoor uh, track team, uh, excuse me, boys and girls indoor track teams our league champions, so that's uh, terrific, particularly where the, those two schools, particularly Bridgewater-Rainham, have always been very, very difficult 
to get past in, uh, in track. Um, some of our accolades, again, these are to be continued as we do have another whole season. Uh, the three league champions, 13 of our 15 teams have qualified for state tournament play. We have six tournament victories. We have three South sectional semifinalists, 40 plus league all-stars, uh, four Eastern Mass all-stars, and our one MIA coach of the year, <laughs> in Mr. Bro, um, who by the way, and I won't go on, um, it, it, certainly when, when we started this program a number of years ago, I went to the annual meeting and they presented about unified track and all the, uh, the joys that go along with it and what a terrific program it is and all the upsides. And it's difficult to start a new program, particularly most schools are short resources or to get people involved. But the way that our community, our school community especially, embraces the special education population, uh, the way our staff surrounds themselves around those people, in particular, Mr. Bro, uh, as well as Mike Capello and, and, and others, um, countless others, um, Coker Pierpont, there's so many that, that contribute. It was a natural fit and, and quite frankly, such an easy thing for me to, to embrace because I knew we had such wonderful people to support the program and you see, I think we probably have one of the biggest unified track and unified basketball programs in, maybe in the state. Um, so that's kudos to, to those people. So I just wanted to, again, congratulate John formally, uh, well-deserved and uh, I'm really glad Mr. Tebow made that sec suggestion that we, we move your name forward. Um, the crowds, um, this one here can always fluctuate from year to year because do we have home games for state tournaments? Um, oh, that's not, doesn't look good up there. Um, all right, we'll skip ahead, but uh, the crowds themselves, I'll, I will let you know, we had 32 games, and I will update the committee with, um, after the spring, I'll give you, I'll send you a formal copy of, of, of this once it's all done. We did host 32 contests this year, sold 5,610 tickets for a grand total of 27,414, with that number is very low. Uh, it's much lower than what we typically do um, in past years. Again, it, it, sometimes it's dictated by the success of our team, sometimes it's dictated by the schedule, and probably more importantly, the number of home games we host in state tournament, which is sort of just how the teams do. So, um, but I will update you as well. The, uh, the student. Um, Four of our, our top 10 ranked seniors are student athletes. Uh, nine of our top 20 are senior uh, are student athletes. And uh, we had 1,030, even though it was closer to 600 students that participated, you know, they all have to receive a report card four times a year. So out of the 1,036 possibilities, only six students were given bad news this year about not being able to participate, which is, I mean, I, don't, I didn't do the percentage, but that's extremely low. Uh, makes my job certainly a lot easier to not have to walk around and pull people off of practice fields and so forth and disappoint coaches and players that they will be without their friends. So um, a big component, uh, we're very fortunate that many of our athletes, as you can see tonight with Charlotte um, being a recipient as well, they're involved, they do a lot of other things and, and they're, they, they take their studies seriously. Um, and last but certainly not least, and this is not an all-encompassing um, list, um, this is just a, a small sampling of what our teams do above and beyond out in the community, different things, different awareness nights, different uh, fundraising efforts, different giving of their time um, from breast cancer to substance abuse to uh, <coughs> gifts to give around Christmas time, cleaning up around the facilities, um, and so forth. So um, I just highlight that just to show that our student athletes um, you know, there's people that obviously they look at our budgets, they see that it costs a lot of money to run these schools, um, and, and athletics certainly is a piece of that um, budget. But you know, we like to think that our kids give as much as they receive with you know their their level of play in the field, but also some of the stuff that they give back to the community as well. So uh, that's just a little sample of that. Um, and so that's it for for the athletic side of things. And I will update you at the end of the year with a more uh, finalized version of that. Um, and if I may briefly just update the committee as well on, on some of our health and phys ed initiatives this year. Um, our elementary school staff continues to build on the base of uh, our SPARC physical education curriculum, which is adopted a number of years ago. Uh, we still continue to add some of uh, our own um, professionally developed programming that they received since that time 
but also keeping in mind that that program that we have is sort of the base of what we do at that level. We've also started to have some of the teachers within the district go watch one another uh, for some model lessons that they can bring back to their schools to provide some better continuity within the district and so that the kids are receiving the same sort of uh, experience whether they're at Potter School or they're at DeMello School. Um, at the middle school level, uh, there's been a couple of sort of joint efforts with the middle school and the high school. One is our SOS where we've partnered with the health department to provide some suicide awareness training uh, within the classroom. Uh, another is uh, a grade 8 through 12 health survey that we conducted in April. Uh, we have not gotten the results back finalized from um, the agency that has volunteered to assist us with that. We should get those back, I would imagine, within the next month or so. But that was a survey that was conducted from all of the students uh, that were in that day for grades 8 through 12, really to just give us a better idea. I think we all read, we all know some of the challenges that we're facing in the society, the obvious ones, but this would speak a little bit more specific to the kids in Dartmouth, uh, maybe give us a better idea how we can adapt some of our out-of-school programming, but also, more importantly, our classroom instruction and maybe some areas that we need to focus a little bit and get a better handle on within, within our own schools specifically. So we're hoping to have an update for you all on that as well um, at some point in the near future. And last but not least, the high school, um, uh, we've, uh, the big news for us is, is the schedule change for next year. I know there's been a lot of mixed emotion over the years about that. I know that the health and phys ed folks um, in, in many ways are looking forward to it and that we're able to offer probably a more complete program to our, student, uh, excuse me, our students um, and they, they'll be, probably get an, a better exposure to everything that we have to offer instead of being maybe just taking the same sort of selection of courses through their four years, they'll be able to experience the entire program from you know, your traditional team activities to our, our health curriculum, but also our fitness component, um, dance, yoga. Um, right now, I think a lot of the kids are getting sort of what they like to do and not being exposed to some things that I think are important for them to, to at least try because much of what you do in phys ed is lifelong activities that they can take far beyond the four years that they're with us at Dartmouth. So that's exciting for next year. Um, and uh, I, I appreciate all of the work that our high school phys ed staff, uh, led by Mr. Gaffney, has done to work on, on coming up with those course descriptions and what those selections will look like with our new schedule. Um, Mr. Gaffney was also pa uh, paramount in, in securing funds for a uh, Game Changers <coughs> program this year. Um, which um, was pretty much a week-long anti-violence uh, prevention program um, that he worked with a, a, a good portion of the school community. They did a lot of um, sort of scenarios. They, they presented information. They ended up having a, um, a culminating event as well. So, um, you know, trying to secure funds to, to s sort of supplement some of our instruction within the classroom and do some things above and beyond. And, and I, you know, I appreciate the, the efforts of Mr. Gaffney and, and what he's done at the high school with that program as well. So unless you have questions, that's, that's uh, an update from, from what we have. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cameron. Dr. Jenkins? I, I don't have any questions. I'll just say, you know, my son participated in sports at the high school. It was well run and well done. And it, it really does focus on developing them not just as athletes, but as all around people, which I really appreciated. It was a good, ex great experience. Thank you. Glad to hear. Yes, Kathleen? I, um, um, again, congratulations, John. I just want to note there that, uh, you know, you always have been there for the folks that I'm, you know, um, mm -hmm. advocating for. Um, and I just, you know, speak to, like you said, that the service mindedness, the this, the, the, the education first, you know, that well-rounded, you know, all the policies. And the best examples that I can think of as a parent, I don't, um, I'm in the stands and I don't maybe know the rules, but I'm there, uh, <laughs> is when, when um, the best examples have been those teams where um, the varsity team really embraces the farm team, like their little JV, and they, they work as one. That, that has been um, the best part. Um, those are the highlights and the teams that I've seen really embrace that. Um, so thank you. Thank you, and um, uh, it was just interesting to get an overview of both the athletics and the health. I've never, we've never had this before, so it was very informative, and uh, thank you, and thank you, your staff, and all the people that support the athletic program. 
and the health program. Thank you. I will just echo the uh, comments of my uh, fellow colleagues. I really enjoyed your presentation, Mr. Karen. I think we got a group, or you have a group of, uh, you know, very talented coaches and educators that deliver high quality instruction uh, to our students to make them really well rounded individuals. Um, and not just, you know, we're not just talking sports, we're talking the whole individual academics and, and the service behind it as well, the after school piece of it. So thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chair. Go ahead. Uh, could you talk a little bit about the fitness center and how it's oh, being sure, used? Oh, sure, yeah. How um, did I forget that? <laughs> we, yeah. we had a giant renovation last year, yes. of course, and uh, we hired a fitness coach or whatever. Yeah, yeah. So how you do you forget that, right? That? That's yeah. one of the best things Because it's did. beautiful. <laughs> forget it. seems like it was three years ago I now. know. Um, <laughs> So yeah, so we um, we received a gift from the um, uh, oh my god, I'm drawing a blank. Um, <laughs> It'll come to you. Yes, it will. Um, and, and we've been sitting on the money for for a number of years to want because we really wanted to make um, really good use of it and not just have it be where we we picked at it and we you know because we could always use money for everything, but I really think that you know if you have a family who wants to put that aside for something, it's gotta be for something that's really um, Howland family, thank you very much. Um, that you, you can remember, something we will remember. So, um, we was kicking the idea of, of developing that center um, and we finally got it done last summer. Um, we were able to sort of combine what was most best known as the dance room in, uh, along with what was best known as the weight room which was really a classroom with radiators and sinks and really, really old equipment. Um, and we were able to come up with, I think, a good hybrid that went, it was a win-win. The dance room was enhanced with the dance floor um, and, the, and the, uh, the fitness center, which was sort of a part of the dance room, was enhanced a little bit. And then the weight room was brought in with brand, all brand new power racks and, and, and state-of-the-art equipment, and we left the old stuff behind. Um, and I think it's been a great addition. Um, through the help of the school administration, and, and, I, and I, I believe I'm not speaking out of turn when I say school, school choice monies um, were put to really good use. I think, again, one of the benefits to that program is we had money to do this. We were able to secure a, um, a strength and conditioning coach um, who's there every day after school. Um, I would be lying if I said we are off and running with that program. I think it, we have a ways to go, but I think that's a cultural thing. I think it's where the school sort of Needs to, there needs to be a greater awareness. We need to promote that a little bit better, and I think s teams and, and athletes need to, I think, be just a little bit, we need to change how we do it, but I think once we, once we better utilize that room, I think sky's the limit. I think we've had a lot of success for, for years with minimal use of that portion of, of, of what we do um, in terms of strength training. I think obviously we, with the obvious teams, like some football players are doing it, but. This is an opportunity for everyone, mm -hmm. uh, male, female, uh, fall, winter, spring athlete to get in there in season, but not only in season, but get in there in the out of season to sort of make those little difference, um, those things that make a difference in the weight room, that, that time off season. And we've done everything we can do, and I really appreciate having what we have. Very few schools have that. I, so I don't know how I forgot to mention it. <laughs> um, so we're very appreciative uh, that we do have that. Ago. What's that? Because it was like three years ago. Yeah, it seems like it was three years ago. I forget that it was this year. So that's a growing program, I, and I welcome you all, any, any of you, or anybody in the community really, to, to swing by and see that. Um, it, it's, it's, quite a, it's quite a change, and it's a humongous opportunity. I'll put in a plug. Any parents who are currently spending money out of pocket mm -hmm. to go outside of our walls to get um, strength training through coaches, um, you can get it for free after school at our high school. Um, you know, I think actually I see... Mrs. Lemieux here, her, her and her uh, fantastic GRIT program, mm -hmm. they've utilized um, you know, the coach Martin in there quite a bit, and, and I think that the more it's kids and the more programs that grab onto it, I think our, our program, you know, this PowerPoint will have even more mm -hmm. championships and, and so forth, so um, thank you for reminding me. <laughs> Good show. So I'd also like to, as a, as a former college athlete who will most likely need a knee replacement um, in the near future, I'd like to also highly encourage the, particularly the girls teams and to try to work that in there because the research is pretty clear that um, strength and conditioning can be very good at preventing particularly knee injuries, which is what I had among uh, female athletes. So I'd really like to see us getting 
all of the teams in there, but in particular the girls' teams, because that can be really uh, beneficial to their long-term health. You'll be happy to know that the two weeks prior to spring, we did sort of a, we kind of called it a boot camp. We had about 35 kids, not every, not every session, but that was the, the big day was 35. More than half were, were our female athletes that were in there, you know, probably doing some things they've never done before um, in, in, in an environment that they've never been in. But it was interesting to see them. I, I took a peek at, at them working. So we're hoping to do a few more of those. I think once the kids get a taste of it mm -hmm. and see what it can do for them, I think those numbers will start to increase mm -hmm. in that room. You'll get the word of mouth mm -hmm. from yeah, and you we know, need to work, to another. work yeah. a little bit harder. It was one of those things that we were really able to get going sort of in the middle to late fall. So it, yeah, it's, we haven't quite gotten to that point where we have a full cycle of time for the kids. So I think it'll be, it'll be really good. Yeah, maybe a training for the coaches. So they yeah, know absolutely. They and we brought, when we hired Coach Martin, we brought in as many coaches as could make it that day just to let him, them know what we did have to offer, uh, both in season, out of season, as, as a team, to work with them and just their team in season for, you know, a couple of half-hour sessions. Um, you know, just, again, to, it's new. It's new. It, it, for the most part, kids have done what they do. We get them. We coach them in their sport. And I think, you know, we, we see that to get to that next level, and we're really talking about straight athletics here. Mm -hmm. um, the kids can, can benefit tremendously by doing that extra, both outside of their season and with, with their team. So, Anybody else? Thank you. Right. Thank you. Mr. Thank Cameron, you. thank you very much. Excellent presentation. We appreciate you. appreciate your time. <clears throat> All right. Next item, resolution for driver training. Mm -hmm. Are you going to read that, yeah, Bonnie? Um, yes, you want I, me to? I have it here. Okay. Sure. Mr. Kiley asked me to step in for him. He said yep. this is uh, something that was done a couple of years ago and yep. just a <coughs> routine business. Yep. So resolution awarding a driver training program, whereas Dartmouth Public Schools has opted to renew its contract with Martin Auto School, Inc., pursuant to item number 14 of the bid specifications dated April 20th, 2016 for the school year 2018 2019. Whereas the following 2016-2017 bid result will continue for the school year 2018-2019. Martin Auto School, Inc., 487 Bellevue Avenue, New Bedford, Mass., 02746. Cost to be paid to the town by the bidder, $1,328 per class. Resolved that Martin Auto School, Inc., 487 Bellevue Avenue, New Bedford, Mass., 02746, be awarded the Dartmouth High School Driver Training Program for the 2018-19 school <coughs> year based on Dartmouth Public <coughs> School specifications dated April 20, 2016. So. Second. Moved by Dr. Jenkins, second by Mr. Oliver. On the motion, any discussion? Chair hearing on all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? And the chair will abstain as this money flows through the student activity account, which my wife handles. So Thank we'll you. do that. Thank you. New business. Last day of school for the 2017-18 school year. This is something I asked uh, Dr. Gifford to put on, and mm -hmm. we need just a vote. It's something we usually do every year, but it's a vote of the committee to, at this time, set the last day of school to be uh, Tuesday, June 19th, 2018, uh, as we used five, school, five snow days this year. And the caveat to this is, is that if, God forbid, something happens between now and, you know, we have to extend it a day, it'll extend a day. Hopefully it doesn't. Mm -hmm. It's a caveat that we put in there every year, so I would need a motion to uh, make the last school day Tuesday, June 19th, 2018. I move. Moved by Dr. Kara Fotis, second. second by Ms. Amaral. On the motion, any discussion? Madam Superintendent, are we okay with that? I'm good. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. That'll set middle school graduation <laughs> to be the uh, those the Monday night, the 18th, mm -hmm. okay? This is Amal, get your two hour speech ready. <laughs> On it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, Madam Superintendent. Okay. Thank you. Uh, for my update tonight, I just wanted to provide the committee a quick update, I hope, on uh, the trip that I took to Portugal, which I alerted you to, that um, if you recall, uh, superintendents were asked to submit a proposal 
um, to obtain a grant, a part, be part of the grant funding uh, to attend port, uh, travel to Portugal, uh, you know, based on if we had Portuguese taught in our classes, Portuguese culture, et cetera. So lo and behold, I was chosen. And um, the group was FLAD, which as you saw was the Luzo American Foundation for Development. And um, did I not know when I got there that uh, Dr. Jenkins' colleague is one of the uh, directors of the group, so it all came together once I was there. So what they were um, really talking about was this uh, study in Portugal network. And as you can see, I hope you can see some of that anyway, it's a group that's uh, supported by lots of different entities, including the Portuguese government, the U.S. Embassy in Lisbon, and uh, Fulbright Commission of Portugal, et cetera. And this group offers all kinds of either summer programs, unpaid internships, uh, lots for grad students, uh, undergrad as well, they can apply, but also that they're looking to really expand programs that we can offer to our high school students as well as some of our high school staff. So that would be something we'd be um, looking into over time. And of course, the purpose of the trip was once again to <coughs> explore the Portuguese culture, trying to expand our partnerships with folks over there as well as our Portuguese community and to uh, encourage, which some of the school districts didn't have uh, enough staff to teach Portuguese in their um, school districts. For example, believe it or not, Brockton is struggling, because one of the superintendents was from Brockton, is struggling to get Portuguese teachers. So that was one of the things we talked about. Our guides, <laughs> Michael Baum, who again is Dr. Jenkins' colleague from UMass Dartmouth, is one of the directors, and Paula Vicente, um, the deputy director over there um, in Lisbon, and she was quite a hoot, I have to say. She was <laughs> terrific. So some of the highlights for the study in Portugal network um, that we saw, uh, we were welcomed by the FLAD president, Professor Vasco Rado. We had our presentation from Michael. Um, he talked about, he gave us a lecture on Portuguese national identity. We talked about some of the key points, what SIPIN could bring if we were to bring students over there as well as faculty, um, et cetera. And we took some educational trips, of course. We met with the education minister of Portugal and we did, of course, some sightseeing, um, absolutely, and culture and food. We were able to meet with uh, the U.S. Embassy representative, Margaret Young. She talked a lot about some of the work that the U.S. Embassy was actually right across the street from the FLAD uh, building. <coughs> and I have my little pin from the U.S. Embassy, so Portuguese and U.S. Uh, she just talked about what they do to outreach and try to get the partnerships and any help that they could provide for districts that might be interested in uh, partnering uh, relative to some of these educational exchanges. So then we took some educational trips. We visited various schools, and this one was, um, we had a presentation. The lady on the left was the director of the school. The other lady was sort of like a department chair teacher. She spoke fantastic English um, and did the presentation for us. The other woman um, did not speak so much English, so she just stood, looked pretty a long way. Yeah, she was great. Um, so this is a school, they call them school clusters. And in this particular cluster, there were four schools, uh, two pre-K-4s, one 5-8, and a head school. They called the head school a 7-12, which included both academic and a vocational school. They talked a lot about, um, you know, they talked about the difficulties and the strengths that they have in their school, and very common to what we have. Um, monitoring effectiveness of school, uh, measuring school effectiveness was one of their big things, Main, maintaining educational support. Um, they talked a lot about instructional practices to engage students and the uh, curricular articulation, both vertical and horizontal. And one of the things a lot of the school people talked about was trying to enhance student creativity and innovation. They compared that, they said the U.S. had that entrepreneurial ship um, mindset as opposed they, they, they felt they could not get it out of their students. I don't know why, but many of them mentioned that. One of the big things they talked about and we found very odd, it's a very centralized educational system. The government doles out teachers like resources. So they talked about the teacher rotation. You, could ha you can't build a community in your school, your own little school, because next year your teachers might be told to move two hours away. So they don't 
they did not do the hiring. The principals and the, the schools did not do the hiring mm -hmm. themselves. As I said, teachers, once teachers got, and I guess you could uh, refer to it as a professional status, I don't know how many years it took, but once they got that, then they could be pretty well um, certain they were going to stay in that school, but normally every year they were rotating from schools to school depending on where the resources were needed. That included specialists, so again, to build a community, which we, we so embrace as building our community and relationships, was difficult. Um, they did feel they had lots of collaboration with, they had good opportunity to collaborate, have teachers collaborate, and they had free teacher training, um, which, and they felt they had a good, real close relationships with their families, and they really valued education. And of course, we always say kids will be kids. We walked into some of the rooms, the, they had a lab going, and th these kids were just dying to um, have their pictures taken, and then we had um, an English class here on the right, so we got to visit some of those. We also visited, as you see, it was a tourism and hotel studies. Um, this was a dual building where uh, there were high school students as well as a higher ed. And big, big tourism, restaurant, hotel management, opportunities for students to study. Um, tons of applicants, we're talking like about a, it's 800 applicants for about 100 slots, say in tourism, et cetera. But as you know, I mean, being a European country like that, tourism is a big thing, hotel management. If you look at the bottom right, the real funny thing is they had two rooms filled with alcohol. Because, mm -hmm. So we all walked in and went, whoa, this was the high school class. Because they said, well, if they're learning to work in a restaurant or whatever, they had to learn everything there was about being a bartender, delivering drinks. So we, we kind of got a kick out, that, kick out of that. The other thing that was caught our eye is as we walked through the halls, people walked out of rooms with cigarettes. Not lit, but at least, you know, the cigarettes. So I don't know, it was just a little cultural thing that yeah. kind of threw us for a loop. Um, <laughs> but they did once again say the man on the left was in the higher ed, the man on the right was the director of the high school area, and they said the demand for these classes far outweighs the supply of opportunities, but the government will not allow them to increase it because they feel that they take away students that might go to other schools. So it kind of made no sense, but that's what they said. Uh, another school we met, we visited, you, you can see very, very diverse, 1,200 students in this school. Um, Pre-K, they call it a first basic, second basic, and a third basic. Very serious social integration problems in this school, this neighborhood school, uh, race, class, education. A uh, number of these students we had spoken to just arrived within three months from, um, could have been uh, Nepal, wherever it might be. Some spoke no English, others rattled everything off very quickly. We had a, a great time speaking to a couple of these students and then visited some. I love the little girl on the left, the smile. Mm. We went into her art class and, and she was just, just full of joy. Um, they have multicultural groupings. They had 22 different nationalities in this particular school. A high number of Portuguese um, Romanian students, mm. and with the Romanian students, they had a huge absentee issue. Um, they tried to bring the school to the communities to get them to come to school. Um, it was just that whole thing of trying to uh, be, support the family, mm -hmm. basically. 63% um, social support. 63% of the students receive social supports, whatever that might entail, lunch programs, etc. Um, and they also had a special ed population uh, for the autistic students as well as uh, anyone with other um, problems. So some of the major takeaways from the whole uh, program, as I said, they call them clusters, they're groupings of schools, 811 of them throughout um, the area. They called it a centralized and devolved school management. So it starts at the top and then they give out authority as they see fit. Compulsory education just happened a few years back um, from grades uh, from 6 to 18 or the child could have a secondary school graduation. As we said, it's a lower primary, upper primary, lower secondary, upper secondary, um, where they could get their high school diploma or a certificate for they choose then a general voca vocational or specialized artistic program once they have that certificate. Uh, there were four exams, and they do determine their access to higher education once they hit that 12th grade. And of course, it's all established and controlled by the uh, Ministry of Education. As I said before, the government controls the placement of the resources, including 
special needs population, a uh, psychologist, whatever it might be. Um, it's a national curriculum. They were very proud that they had just instituted a 25% flexibility for the schools themselves, local control. So, but other than that, it was um, wow. centralized. And you will all die over this one, because we did. They've had, uh, obviously, economic troubles in um, 2008, nine, nine years, whatever it was. Um, they had a nine-year salary freeze. So we talked to the two ladies you saw in the very beginning, nine years salary freeze. They did not move, not even salary, but also um, experience. It didn't exist. So when they come to their retirement, they, they lose that time. That doesn't even count towards their retirement years. That, wow. That's it. So they said none of us will ever reach it. The ladies we spoke to were wow. you know, in their 50s or yeah. so, and they're like, forget it. Um, and of course, uh, some of the issues, poverty, mindset, they, I talked to you about the entrepreneurial thing, um, value of education, absenteeism, uh, resources, and autonomy. Um, we then met with the Secretary of State uh, for uh, Education, and he, he, he admitted some of those issues. He said they're trying to work on that, um, but some of the fallout from all of that is some of these things that they've launched a national debate about are again the curriculum moving from discrete courses to an alignment, um, thinking he said about moving to review, revise curriculum to promote depth. They talk the same thing we do, depth over breath, that kind of thing, too much, you know. And um, health, mental health, all of the same conversations we're having, talking about encouraging uh, project based, critical thinking, et cetera. They want to enhance their leadership and be able to provide some kind of stability of the teaching staff. We brought up to him the fact that the, all of the staff had talked about the rotation of the teachers. He said, yes, we get it, but we're short on resources, and we have to put them where we feel they're needed. That was the answer. So, But of course, they look at they're going to have a giant uh, retirement going on, and are they attracting teachers or not? Um, I, we spoke to the director, that first director. She'd been there 20 years. She's the principal. She said in euros it comes to about 24000 a year, or she makes. So anyway, we also uh, visited this National Center for Scientific and Technology and Culture. And uh, the big thing about this was they have partnered with the schools and where teachers are um, available, they're all across all of Lisbon. They bring their classes in for a week of study. You can see the little kids there. I loved it. They give them the jackets. They're like little scientists. It was all hands-on, all project-based. The teachers can either allow the folks from the, um, they have um, experts come in as well and work with the students. The teachers can work with them. Teachers from the schools can provide their own lessons or just be uh, a helper and let the folks that are at the scientific museum um, take over. So that was fun, just watching them play with some goopy stuff and whatnot. We also took a trip to this, um, it was called the Asado Estuary, Asado, I'm not quite sure how to pronounce it. Um, and it was a fantastic trip. We, but luckily we had a fantastic day. Um, Ocean Alive, these two young ladies are passionate, passionate, they're marine biologists, passionate about saving the ocean, saving the seagrass, for example. So we had a, a lecture uh, about all of that with um, what they call the fisher women, which um, is quite the thing there. They grow up on the ocean. They're the fisher women, they go out. We then visited the giant fish and fruit and vegetable market, like you know, <coughs> giant, um, where you can see on the left, the fisher woman is there giving us an explanation how she goes about catching all of these things and the octopus and all of that stuff. And um, then we were able, on the right, uh, took a cruise on one of the, uh, an old, old sailboat um, out on the ocean and uh, where we saw dolphins. And we, they treated us to a traditional lunch and we're, we're cuttlefish. And then she, um, another fisherwoman explained same kind of thing of what her job was and, and how she uh, was on the ocean all the time. They did two high school trips last year, uh, 10 day trips. and. Um, where uh, all the activities is all there, all provided by these marine biologists and these fisherwomen, and uh, they were uh, put up in hostels, et cetera. So certainly something we would love to explore. Um, and then, of course, that was it. We did some culture, some history, 
beautiful things. We did um, some photo music on the last night, um, castles and coastlines, and had a fam fabulous time, made some great contacts, and um, that was our group. So it was a great trip, and I'm just very, very fortunate to have been involved in that. And um, again, I think the one thing is every educator we talk to, the same passion that we all feel for our students and you know, we're all the same, and as I said, the kids are the same. It's just what resources you have to work with. So it was a great, great time. And that's it. Super. Yep. Thank questions, you. comments. Thank you, Bonnie. You're welcome. Thank you. Any comments, questions? This looks like a fabulous time. It was yeah, fabulous. It was. Good. Yep. Okay. Uh, just a quick question. Yes. Is there any plan to continue? Um, You've got a group there. Will you be meeting periodically? Uh, I, I, I the Fortunately, plan. I knew most of them already, but I did meet a few new folks. But uh, one of the things we want to do is get together, and we really do want to discuss that marine um, mm -hmm. science program mm -hmm. and see if perhaps we can apply for a grant for a few folks from each district mm -hmm. to go together. And so we certainly will continue. Um, the other thing is Julie Hackett, who's the uh, superintendent in Taunton, mm -hmm. who put this together with, um, I'm not quite sure what representative started the whole program and offered that we take a chance on this grant, um, is going to be sending us uh, templates so we can all put part of what we saw, what we felt, what the best thing, and so a giant report for all of us. So I think, I think there'll be something to come out of it for sure. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. Mm -hmm. Anything else? No problem. All right, good. Uh, I have nothing to uh, report on. Uh, we had we did have uh, one late item that uh, popped in, and that is uh, a request from our sailing team. They're get they're going down to uh, Annapolis, Maryland, in a couple of weeks, uh, May tw uh, May 11th to the 13th, uh, for a sailing competition. That uh, I guess, as I read this, could it, they could end up uh, ending up in the nationals mm -hmm. type of deal. So. Good for them and good luck, but uh, they're going down to Maryland, so we need a motion to allow them to go. Motion, motion by Dr. Kara Fotis. Second. Second by Dr. Jenkins. On the motion, any discussion? Chair, hearing none. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Good luck. Bring us back another trophy for our <laughs> overgrown, over, overfilled trophy case. That'll be fine. Okay, our, any? My colleagues have anything? Dr. So Jenkins. I, I have two things. One, I just want to remind um, our teachers and administrators that um, sometime soon, I can't remember the date now, the DEF grant deadline is fast approaching, so please get those in. They're on mm -hmm. the website. And then I also have a question. Um, I was hoping <coughs> whether now or next meeting we can talk about the status of the Dartmouth rep to the VOC schools. Mm. I'll fill you. I'll fill you in on that. No. Okay, that's because um, that's a process we have to get going yeah. on. Correct. Unfortunately, uh, hang on for a second here. <coughs> there was a letter that was came to, me. Came to you yes. back, and which is fine, no biggie, and that type of deal, and then. Uh, there is another. So let, let me just oh, tell that's the, right. the committee. I got the letter. Yeah. And then I passed it along, and then it kind of fell through the cracks. Right, and that's fine. So, and so it we, needs, it, we need to. It needs to come back up. Well, the problem is this, and I've got to get up. You know, things are in a little bit of a flux in uh, town hall. I'll try and get over there tomorrow to see uh, Mr. Barnes. But there is a letter dated February 28th, 20, 2018. Uh, to Mr. Shea, who was our current rep. Uh, it says, please be advised that you were appointed to the Greater New Bedford Regional Vocational Technical High School School Committee for a term to expire on May 1st, 2021. So it's like the Board of Selectmen have overstepped okay. and didn't include us in the process. <laughs> okay. So I gotta go check with them and find out what's going on. It says, you know, it's the standard letter you need to be sworn in at the clerk's office prior to attending. Et cetera, et cetera. So I've got to go check with okay. people, and it was, you know, Mr. Cressman. So okay. that's where that stands. So okay. that's. So they continued the appointment. Yeah, they without did. Consulting without, with us. without consulting us or the 
you know, whether they. What was that letter dated? February 28th. So is that the letter dated to me or the letter no, dated that's to the Mike? The letter dated to Michael. Okay. Your letter is the 29th, and I okay. remember you bringing it up. Yes. Okay, and, that, and then the uh, letter from uh, Mr. Cressman to uh, Mr. Shea is dated February 28th. Okay. So. <laughs> You know, here we go again. We have an end around. I'm just I'm not glad going it's there. My, Mr. Shea and mm -hmm. not someone else. Yeah, no, no. But, uh, amen. I'm good with that. But, it, you know, again, as I kind of made mention at the joint meeting, it would have been nice if they could have said something. Right. Said I also, something. I will also say I bring this up because I have the utmost respect for Mr. Shea, but I would like to have the opportunity to talk to him about just to talk to him about how he deals with potential conflicts of interest. I mean, it's not to say that. He's not ethical, right? But uh, I, I use this example in talking to someone. Um, I have recused myself from sitting. There's a town UMass committee that's being put together, and I've recused myself because I have a conflict of loyalty. I sit on the school committee. I need to represent the town, but I work at UMass. And so, right, I think I don't think that Mike doesn't act in Dartmouth's interest, but I want to explicitly say to him and remind him that when he's at the table, he is the agent of the town of Dartmouth. And if those sorts of conflicts come up, say discussion about Vogue expanding into some areas where we might offer programming, that, that be right. reminded that, that, he, that we are his <laughs> principal and he's our agent and that's how we expect him mm -hmm. to behave. I don't think he wouldn't, but I just like, would have had the opportunity to remind him of that. Yep. Let me, give me one second, Chris. Do, we still, do you still get the minutes for the uh, Vogue School Committee? And again, I'll put in my... 20 years ago had on but we used to they used to they used to come over to us and we used to get copies of them in our package type of deal okay okay maybe that's something we can yeah follow up and have them send us the minute you know I mean I realize you know it's it's a March meeting they meet in May so they approve the May one so we get them you know the end of April for argumentative sake type of deal but at least we'll have Let's see them yeah you know and again I you know they don't give a lot of information, but at least we have them. Sense of what's happened. Sense of what's happened, and that's it. Mr. Oliver. So since our, our last joint meeting with the Select Board and the Finance Committee, I, I have the luxury of having to speak to Mr. Shea since he's my current superintendent of schools. Uh, but that being said, he did uh, present to the Select Board, I believe, uh, this in the past six months. I think it was him and the other rep that had presented, and I don't, you know, don't hold me to it, presented to the select board, and I believe Mr. O'Brien, the superintendent of schools from the effort Vogue, was also in present, was also there. I know so, they did it at the finance committee. Okay, so mm -hmm. maybe it was the finance committee. but in their budget. That they right, yeah. right, I'm just well, wondering if it's budget. the same or different. However, uh, he said he would be more than happy to come in front of this board, yeah. in front of this committee, as well as the select board, and answer any questions uh, that you may have or should have. Maybe that's, you know, yeah. we're getting to the end of the year. And that and maybe that's, you know, something either, uh, you know, in June or, uh, mm. you know, first early part of next school year we can uh, yeah. Yeah. we can look at look at. I mean, we've had yeah, the, he said we've had we've had them here happy. before. I mean, we've had uh, uh, when Dr. Kelly was on, he was there, and uh, the lady that was the superintendent and her name escapes me at the moment, but uh, she was here that time so I'm yeah I would personally love to hear from Superintendent sure. O'Brien as oh, well as our yeah, yeah, school committee you. representatives yeah, yeah. You know, the business manager mm -hmm. and everything that's fine I'm good with that yeah, thank okay. you yep anybody else nothing nope. okay our next meeting is going to be two weeks from tonight Monday April 14th the day after Mother's Day May May that's 14th May 14th <laughs> didn't I say May 14th April I said April. I got five here I got five <laughs> Oh, we're not going backwards. No. no, 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 no. Thank you. All right. Uh, May 14th, 2018 at 630 here in the Quinn Community Room. Uh, that being said, the chair will uh, entertain a motion to adjourn into executive session for uh, discussion on personnel and grievance matters and collective bargaining and not return to open session. So uh, moved. Moved by Dr. Jenkins, second by Ms. Amaral. On the motion, any discussion? Roll call vote, please, Kate. Yes. Dr. Jenkins? Yes. Kathleen Amaral? Yes. Dr. Caraphotis? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen.
and happy Mother's Day to all the ladies.